My name is Dr Chris Diaramid and I'm going to tell you about plastics and the environment. But first I'm going to start with a story. Once I was reading a wonderful book called Factfulness and it told a story about how important it is that we act based on facts. Before the early 1990s, parents were advised to place their infants to sleep on their front, contrary to advice from clinical research. If they had listened to that scientific evidence, then they might have prevented over 10,000 infant deaths in the UK and at least 50,000 infant deaths in Europe, the USA and Australasia. But they didn't listen. In fact, it took decades for doctors to change their advice, even when the data was so clear, thousands more died. This talk aims to reset the way we think about plastics in the environment by showing that our current beliefs don't match reality. The science tells us the exact opposite of what we're being told online. And the reason it's important to know the truth is that when we ignore the facts and the science, we end up destroying the very thing we set out to protect. Here's an outline of the topics we will cover. First, a summary of what we believe now, then a look at what the evidence tells us, and finally, we examine reasons why these two things don't match up. We all recognize that we can't believe everything we see and hear. Traditional media is less reliable than it used to be, and social media is even worse. Here's a study that shows us some numbers. Only 20% of people believe in the local news, and only 4% of people strongly believe in social media. So we all know that we can't trust the usual sources of information that we use, and yet that's where our information is coming from. So how bad is the accuracy of this information? Well, they did a study on millions and millions of tweets and they found out that the lies are 70% more likely to be spread than the truth. That means that we absolutely cannot trust anything we hear on social media. Why? Because the lies are more sensational and sound newer than the truth. The truth's too boring and even when the truth is spread, it never really catches up with the lies. And that's part of what I'm trying to address here. So what are the consequences of being told all of these lies online? Well, it turns out that if you repeat a lie enough times, people believe it. And it doesn't matter how smart you are or how good you are at critical thinking, everybody's susceptible to this. They've done large studies on it. So these lies that we're being told all the time sound like the truth because they sound familiar after a while and we end up becoming brainwashed. And you'll notice on all the slides that I'm presenting here, there is a little um, text at the bottom, which um, I don't know if you can see it here at the bottom of the page. Every time I say something, because I'm a scientist, I support it with scientific evidence. That means that there are giant scientific studies to prove what I'm saying. And that's the opposite to what you hear online. When you see something online, they just claim something sensational with zero proof. Everything I say here and everything I say in my book is proven. I just mentioned my book, The Plastics Paradox. and Let me tell you a little bit about that. I've made it my personal mission to collect and read hundreds of scientific articles to uncover the truth. I didn't go around looking for articles that supported a pre-existing opinion. I went out and found every single piece of information I could. And why me? Well, for one thing, my kids were being taught lies at school. Um, and I found that totally unacceptable. So I decided to go and find the information to present to the teachers and it mushroomed into the book. Also, I'm a leading PhD polymer scientist, so I'm uniquely qualified for this task. As a scientist, I do not make, market or sell plastics. Some people say that they can't trust a plastics expert to talk about plastics. And I find that interesting. I ask them whether they refuse to speak to a medical expert when they're sick. Or if they're sick, do they ask a car mechanic for an opinion or a journalist? Or do you go and ask a medical expert? When you want a medical opinion, you go and ask a medical doctor. And when you want an opinion about the technical details of plastics, you go and ask a doctor in plastics. And that's me. Some of my friends ask me why I've devoted thousands of hours and thousands of dollars of my own money to this topic when it's not my job. I sometimes ask myself the same question. This is why. I'm a professional scientist, so I believe we should base our opinions and our actions on fact, not fiction. Everything we do has an impact on the environment. So we have two choices. Either we have to go and move back into caves, or we can continue to enjoy the modern lifestyle we love so much while making choices that minimize our impact. How do we do that? Well, life cycle analysis is the only proven and accepted way to know what is green and what is less green. 
it considers all environmental impacts. That means uh, raw materials, the manufacturing of a product, the transportation of the product, uh, the function of the product in use, for example, driving your car around, repairs of the product, and also waste and recycling. Companies, governments, and environmental groups all rely on life cycle analysis. It's standardized and it's also peer reviewed for consistency and to make sure that nobody cheats. Any system can be improved upon, but if we were to abandon life cycle analysis, then we'd have to toss a coin to decide what's green. It's better to use a tool that's good but imperfect than to have no tool at all. The outcome of a life cycle analysis depends on many things, including the geographical location that you're considering. So there's no universal answer. However, if you read a hundred of these life cycle analyses, the geographical aspects start to cancel out and average out and you get some trends. So here are the trends that I've noted after reading a bunch of these life cycle analyses. If you can make something out of a hunk of wood, that's usually the greenest option. So for example, wood decking and wine corks are examples where wood is greener than plastic. But most things can't be made out of wood, so plastic is then usually the greenest choice. Paper is sometimes greener than plastic, but usually it isn't. Examples where plastic are greener include shopping bags or grocery bags, where I found 24 life cycle analyses on grocery bags and plastics come out greener in every single case, in every country, no matter where they analyzed it. In 24 studies, plastic bags were greener than paper bags and not a single case saying the opposite. So here we are banning something which is categorically proven to be the greenest option. Banknotes is another example. A lot of banknotes are made of plastic and they're proven to be greener than the paper ones because they last so much longer. And mailer envelopes is another example. Steel, aluminium and glass are far worse due to the extreme heat and the energy needed to make them and their density, which increases the impact of transportation. So these are the general trends that we see. Here's a quick summary of what I discovered when writing the plastics paradox and reading all the science. All of this, as I said, is soundly proven and you'll find all the citations in the book and on the website. Statements I quote are verbatim, so I copy and paste the statements from the scientific articles um, to make sure that there's no spin on it. And as I said, it's all cited so you can check it yourself. If this information is different to what you've heard online or in the press, that's because this is the first time you've actually heard the truth, backed by hard data and presented by a professional scientist instead of some hack. Now I want to show you some very, very powerful new information I discovered after the book was published. So part of the reason for this talk is to zoom out and not just focus in on plastics, but look at the overall picture. I was reading a book about materials and the environment, and I was absolutely shocked to my core when I turned the page and saw this pie chart on the left. This pie chart showed that plastics are only about 1% of the material we use. All we hear about all day long is plastic, as if it was the only material and we're drowning in plastic. Uh, and now I suddenly discover from this book that plastics are less than 1%. I found this information so incredible that I decided to double and triple check it. And when I did, I found out that a number was actually wrong. It's actually too high. The amount of plastics we use is only 0.4% of materials, which is incredible. And you can check this yourself. I've done it using Siri and Alexa and Google. You just say, hey, what's the annual consumption global consumption of plastics, what's the annual global consumption of materials, you divide one number by the other one and you can work out the percentage. This is absolutely shocking to hear that we're obsessing about plastics and it's 0.4% of our problem. So based on that finding, I decided to do a little bit more digging. We're told every day that we're drowning in plastic waste. Of course, no data is ever given. So I decided to go and check the data. How much of this waste is actually plastic? Well, in the book, I already found out that 13% of household waste is plastic and about 10% of what goes into a landfill is plastic. What I didn't know when I wrote the book was that household waste is just 3% of all waste. Industrial waste makes up the other 97%. So it turns out that plastic waste is 13% of 3%, which comes out to be 0.3% of all waste. So once again, we've been told online without evidence that plastic is the cause of all of our worries, and it turns out to be 0.3% of the waste problem. And as we saw in the Plastic Paradox book and on the website, plastics have actually dramatically reduced waste on top of that. 
So we're obsessing about a tiny fraction of the problem. This would be like me going home, cleaning my cutlery drawer and thinking the rest of the house is going to clean itself. There's no way we can solve the world's problems by putting 100% of our effort into 0.3% of a problem. We hear about plastic in the oceans all the time. In the book I explain that there are no huge floating islands, they just don't exist. Scientists say they don't exist, the man who discovered the gyres also say that they don't exist, and there's no soup either. It's just been all dra dramatized for uh, the sake of getting your money out of your pockets by uh, certain environmental groups and journalists who don't care about the facts. It turns out even in these gyres, the maximum amount of, of plastic that you find is about one game die. If you were to take a game die from Monopoly and put it in an Olympic-sized swimming pool, that would be too much plastic for the worst places in the gyres. So I decided to check how much plastic is actually entering the ocean. We see, we hear big numbers, but we don't know what it means. It's very hard to conceptualize these numbers. So it turns out that the amount of plastic entering the, the uh, oceans is this tiny, tiny number. I can't even say it, but it's many, many zeros and 6% per year. So it's, shouldn't, it shouldn't be there, clearly. I'm not saying there should be plastic in the oceans, but the number is rather small compared to what we've been led to believe. And no, there will not be more plastic than fish in the sea. That was debunked as well. I showed that last slide to a friend and he said it would be more meaningful to compare the amount of solid sediment being washed into the oceans from rivers to the amount of plastic. So once again, I went looking for the scientific data and I was able to find it. Plastics make up about 0.05% of the solid sediment being dumped into our oceans and rivers. It's mainly polyethylene, polypropylene, polyethylene terephthalate and polystyrene, which means the plastics that we eat our food out of every day. So they're not very much of a concern from a health point of view. Interestingly, there are also massive amounts of deadly chemicals, munitions and even nerve gas in the ocean, but no one talks about that. I wonder why. They would rather focus on plastics and ignore the things which are actually proven to be toxic. So-called environmental groups are very keen to bring out the turtle pictures. There's even a famous video of a turtle with a brown cylinder of some kind in its nose. But there was never any evidence that that was a, a, made of plastic. They never analysed it. When they were doing the video, they thought it was a worm. You can hear it in the video. They say, oh, is it a worm? Is it a worm? And then afterwards, they suddenly declare it's plastic without any analysis whatsoever. If you're concerned about turtles, you should be looking at these statistics on the left-hand side because I looked up turtle mortality rates, and here they are. You can see that shrimp trawling accounts for up to 50,000 turtle deaths, fishery is up to 5,000, collisions with boats up to 500, dredging up to 50, other 200, and nothing at all about plastics. So that's interesting, isn't it? If you do care about turtles and you're not just trying to get sympathy votes out of people and pry their money out of their pockets in terms of donations, then you would be looking at these causes of death, which are the actual things that turtles suffer from. But they'd rather focus on plastics because it suits their purposes. As well as turtles, we hear a huge amount about whales. I saw another article today about whale deaths. So I decided to look up the science on that. There are many studies on whale deaths, and once again, I've quoted them all here. You can see um, the scientific studies quoted. There are four of them. And these are the causes of whale deaths. Entanglement in fishing gear, natural causes, and vessel strikes where boats hit them. So why are they incessantly telling us that plastics are harming whales when not one single one of these articles even had a mention of the word plastic or bag? Not one mention of either of those as a cause of death. These are multi-decade studies with thousands and thousands of whale deaths listed and not one mention of plastic or bag, and yet that's all we see online. It's just an outright lie. It's told to enrage you and get a donation out of your pocket, and I find it absolutely reprehensible. A while ago, several newspapers covered a story saying that there were these massive amounts of microplastic raining down on our national parks. They said it was several tons of microplastic deposited every year. And I thought, wow, that's hard for me to imagine. Let me work it out as a percentage of, for example, dust that's deposited. So I went and found some studies on that. And I can tell you, it's a lot of work to look up all of these studies. The environmental groups, they like to argue with you and they like to come out with these things and they produce no studies whatsoever. And I've been working on my own with no funding and I've come up with all of these studies and double checked and triple checked everything. So here's just to give you an idea how much hard work it is to actually check the facts. It's easier than spouting nonsense, but I feel better about presenting facts than, uh, than the way that the other side likes to do these things. So anyway, let's look at the Grand Canyon. Uh, you can calculate there'll be 12 tons per year of microplastic dust on the Grand Canyon, and that sounds like a lot. 
and it is a lot, but uh, it depends on, I had no concept of how big the Grand Canyon was. So I went and checked that, and I correlated that with the total amount of dust that would be deposited on an area that size, which is 50,000 tons a year, meaning that microplastics make up 0.03% of all the dust deposited per year. So instead of hearing this tonnage number, which means nothing to us, I've actually looked up the percentage, and it's a rather small percentage. I'm not saying it should be there, but again, it's safe plastics like polyethylene, polypropylene, PET, and things we eat our food out of. But what's the rest of this dust made of, the 99.97%? Well, it's made up in large proportion of quartz, which is known to cause cancer. It's also made up of a large amount of heavy metals, such as lead and cadmium, which are known to be toxic. So isn't it interesting that people would rather focus on 0.03% of safe material, because it's plastic and easy to demonize, and totally ignore things which are known to be toxic and known to cause cancer and are being breathed in in giant quantities. There's an example of where ignoring the science leads you in the wrong direction. Here I've put together an NGO scorecard to see how well these so-called environmental groups are doing at telling us what's green and what isn't and what to do. In the Plastics Paradox book, as you saw, I showed that pretty much everything they've told us is untrue, meaning that the science says the exact opposite. And in this talk, we've zoomed out a little bit to look at the bigger picture. And what do we find? Well, we found that if we were worried about materials use, concrete, metal and woods would be the things we would focus on. But instead, the non-environmental, uh, these non-governmental organizations want us to talk about plastics. If we're worried about material waste, we will be focused on manufacturing, mining, oil and gas, but instead they want us to focus on plastics. If we were worried about turtles, we would be worried about trawling, fishing and boat strikes, but they want us to concentrate on plastic instead. If we're worried about whales, we will be looking at trawling, fishing and boat strikes, but instead they want us to talk about plastic. If we were worried about dust, we would be worried about this inorganic dust which contains quartz and heavy metals, but instead they want us to look at plastic. If we were worried about materials that use giant amounts of energy and create CO2, we would be worried about gold, platinum and palladium, but they want us to talk about plastic instead. And when it comes to grocery bags, if we were worried about things that cause harm, we'd be looking at paper, cotton and bioplastic bags, but instead they want us to focus on plastic bags, which are proven in every single study to be the greenest. So if we look at how well these so-called environmental groups are doing, they're not doing very well at all. In fact, I can't find a single area where they give an evidence which helps the environment or matches the evidence and the science. This means one of two things. Either they're wildly incompetent, in which case they don't deserve our funding and our donations, or they're actually corrupt. And of these two things, in which case they don't deserve our, fo our funding and our donations either. So how do we know which one of these two things it is? Well, it's impossible to know somebody's intent without being inside their mind. But recently there have been some very interesting books by formal environmental group members and they've come out and said, I'm ashamed to have been a part of this group. They're just corrupt and they're just telling you lies and scaring you to get your donations. So there are groups like Confessions of a Greenpeace Dropout by Patrick Moore um, and there's uh, Apocalypse Never by Mike, Michael Schellenberg and you can find several other books along those lines where environmental groups uh, former members have left ashamed and embarrassed and published books explaining that these guys are just trying to rip you off. So here are the conclusions. We've been lied to again and again by groups keen to enrage us and trick us out of our money. We need to start basing our opinions and our policies on facts and evidence. Let's start cleaning up the environment by waking, making wise choices and if you want to do that, please tell your friends about the truths you've learned today. If you know a reporter, please tell them. If you know a CEO or a politician, then please tell them. And if you know Bill Gates or Oprah Winfrey so we can get some publicity for the truth, then please tell them. As you've seen, facts don't catch up with lies. We need every bit of help we can get because the lies are already in people's brains. They spread farther and faster than the truth. And we're playing catch up. We really need to make an impact if we're ever going to change people's minds, stop making stupid policies and stop enriching these groups that are lying to us. The Plastics Paradox book was written so that people could get the story, but all the information is at plasticsparadox.com. And that's important for you to know. I'm not trying to make money out of this presentation. All this information, all the peer reviewed science is available for free at plasticsparadox.com. No registration. I'm not selling you one thing. All I'm doing as a professional scientist is telling you it's time to look at the facts and start making progress instead of pedaling backwards. Sadly, some people are so passionately against plastics that they don't care about the facts. 
they prefer to attack, attack me online, for example. And uh, that, that's a shame because well-intentioned people are making harmful choices due to bad information, just like the story about those infant deaths that we told in the beginning. So if you care about making progress, please remember what we've said here. Go and visit the website and tell anyone you know who's an influencer that we've got to redress this and start to create a brighter future together. Thank you very much for your time.